Latuya Bay. Shaped like a fish with its mouth open to the turbulent waters of the Gulf of Alaska, this alluring inlet has a violent and tumultuous past. Late on the evening of July the 10th, 1958, three small boats lay serenely at anchor in the calm waters of the bay. Aboard the Adri, Howard and his seven-year-old son were just settling in for the night. There was a large rumbling noise from up at the head of the bay. With a slight pause, I thought that everything was over with. But some movement up there caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. A huge wave. It looked like just a big wall of water. To me, a life preserver, he, he said, son, start praying. We're looking at death. And this is exactly my first thought. I had 40 fathoms of anchor chain and it started running out off the boat. Came to the end of the 40 fathoms, just snapped it like a string. We were swept up over the land and up above the trees. That's where I assumed that we were going to end up. Amazingly, their boat was washed back into the bay, but others were not so lucky. One was carried stern first over La Chaussée Spit and dropped into the ocean. The remaining vessel was swept under and sunk without trace while running for the entrance. Back in 1953, scientists visiting Latuya Bay had wondered why mature forests did not extend down to the shoreline where their place had been taken by bands of younger trees. They surmised it must have been due to a tsunami of some sort. But what could be the source of such an immense wave? Now, five years later, here was the answer. An 8.3 magnitude earthquake had broken loose 90 million tons of rock, creating a gravity wave which had reached the astounding record height of 1,720 feet. Put into stark perspective by this illustration. A companion wave, 100 feet high, then raced the length of the bay at 130 miles an hour, stripping the shoreline to bare rock and leaving the bay awash with blocks of ice and the remains of thousands of trees. In the wake of this upheaval, scientists using tree rings and other evidence concluded that in past years there had been at least five similar events, with an average interval between them of 26 years. As we prepared to visit Latuya Bay, we were very aware that 55 years had passed since the catastrophic events of 1958. Cape Spencer Light marks the separation of the inland waters from the stormy seas of the Gulf of Alaska. The weather gods smiled on us and the ocean was calm. Immense snow-capped peaks lining the coast for hundreds of miles were revealed in all their glory. The entrance to Latuya Bay runs north-south and it is not easy to spot from seaward, the most prominent landmarks being a pair of conical hills named the Paps. Range markers show the correct course through the channel, but the rear beacon was hidden in the trees and revealed itself only after we were convinced that it must be missing. During recorded history, this bar has been responsible for the loss of more than 100 lives and demands respect. But today the gulf was calm, our timing right, and transit through the entrance presented no problem. Once inside, we headed towards Cenotaph Island. A cliff on its southern end was home to a colony of black Lake kittiwakes, who wheeled around our heads against the backdrop of the immense mountains. We dropped anchor, launched the tender, and toured the upper bay. The Fairweather Fault runs along the base of the mountains, and Cascade Glacier, like its two companions, is not glistening white, but covered in dirt. The scar from the huge rockfall which generated the wave is still clear to see, as is the trim line marking its height.
Photos taken in 1958 line up exactly with those taken today. Mount Quincy Adams at 13,650 feet and Mount Crillon at 12,700 dominate the skyline. For us the beauty and peace of Latuya Bay was stunning and we celebrated our arrival with a dram of Jura single malt whiskey. But lurking in the back of our minds was the thought that it was an evening such as this that preceded the events of 1958. It was hard to imagine that this place of serene beauty had been the same where hell had broken loose, not once, but many times. A place where winter's ferocious catabatic winds came screaming down from these same peaks at over 100 miles an hour, beating the water into a frenzy and carrying it over the top of Cenotaph Island. Tendrils of mist floated across the calm but moving water, adding a touch of drama to the stillness of the evening. The following morning dawned calm. We took the tender past Cenotaph Island to the beach inland from La Chaussee Spit. Once ashore and the tender secured, we walked along the beach towards the entrance. We saw no bears but recent tracks in the sand were evidence that they were not far away. Wild lupins were in abundance, and the shoreline was still littered with the remains of trees which had been uprooted by the 1958 wave. Walking was difficult over loose stones, with every step an invitation for a twisted ankle. Chris was worried that a curious bear might slash the tender, leaving us stranded on the beach. So we abandoned our walk and instead used the tender to approach the bar, ever mindful of its dangers. In July 1786, two French sailing ships, the Astrolabe and the Bosol, arrived off Latouille under the command of Admiral La Perouse. Two boats were launched to reconnoitre the channel, but as the ships approached the bar, the wind hauled ahead and their sails were taken aback. It must have been a flood tide because the two vessels were then carried into the bay on the current. La Perouse later commented that during his 30 years experience he had never seen two ships so near destruction. A few days later three boats were dispatched to survey the entrance with strict instructions to keep clear until the tide was slack. Ignoring these orders, first one boat and then a second were sucked inexorably into the maw of the channel. Two boats and 21 men were overwhelmed and never seen again. La Perouse left a memorial to the lost men on the island which he named Cenotaph, meaning empty tomb. This memorial disappeared and was later replaced. In 1985 a bronze plaque was installed by the Lutuya Bay Historical Society, but by 2004 this too had been vandalized and stolen. La Perouse stayed 21 days in the bay and went on to sail to Macau and Siberia before heading for present-day Sydney. From there he went north, where both ships were lost in the typhoon in the New Hebrides. The following morning, the day of our departure, 
we awoke to find ourselves shrouded in fog. The time of our leaving was determined by the tide. If we waited, it would have to be until the next high water slack in 12 hours. We cautiously felt our way down the bay, past the kitty wakes. We decided that if visibility improved to enable us to see both sides of the entrance, it would be safe to proceed. The range markers were invisible, but we could follow our inbound course on the plotter. The seas were calm, but the water swirled with strong currents. Once clear of the boulders and cormorant rock, Chris swung venture through a wide arc and pointed our bows north, leaving in our wake memories of a truly remarkable place. <laughs>